Well, a good Thursday to you on this April 14th. You're locked into Real Talk. Thanks for joining us. We're taking your COVID questions today. Uh, not us per se, but our guests, Dr. Lenora Saxinger, Dr. Uh, Darren Markland will be joining us in just over half an hour's time. And uh, we're going to be taking questions as submitted to our official Real Talk Twitter account at Real Talk RJ. We'll be keeping an eye on the hashtag as well, powered by Park Power. That's the Real Talk RJ hashtag. Uh, the two doctors chiming in. We saw them. Uh, I did exchanging thoughts on Twitter. The two of them going back and forth, talking about what they thought might be best policy for 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 COVID management right now. Of course, we don't have to tell you. It's it's the sixth wave of COVID nineteen, and experts are talking about this new variant. Uh, I want to ask the doctors about it. Have you heard about it? This B two B A two sub variant. It's like it's the Omicron X E variant if you're like me your head starts to spin a little bit and you go just tell me what i need to know like is, is it smarter if i do wear a mask or don't or what does this mean for our family uh, easter or passover or ramadan celebrations should we be gathering should we not uh what about a fourth dose of vaccine we got millions of uh, vaccinations that are set to expire so says health canada and then of course there's the international implications as well canada's got these millions of of vaccines uh, these doses available that are expiring as every month ticks by and Canada's only lived up to about 40 percent of its commitment to make sure that vaccines are getting to developing countries as well. So there's a lot to talk about on the covid front and the two doctors will be joining us in about seven minutes time. I'm going to introduce you to someone who's going to be making her debut on Real Talk. It's my sister, Megan. I can't wait for this. I'm excited for this. Yeah, yeah she's a registered clinical counselor out of British Columbia. And uh, and Megan's going to talk to us on how do you know if a counselor or a therapist is a good fit for you? I like this. Yeah, she is not my therapist. I was going to say <laughs> probably not a great fit if your sister is your counselor. But uh, Megan, uh, she and I have a, a, a very special relationship, and she and I have been talking over the past few weeks about how do you pick a good therapist or how do you find a counselor that's the right fit for you? And we know that there's maybe been is it fair to say a bit of a stigma. Uh, around counseling or cou- someone says, I'm going to go see my therapist this week. I'm seeing my counselor this week. And some people might be like, what's wrong? I, I think there used to be. But in this day and age, I think it's the most healthy thing you can do. Yeah. I mean, my, my wife pushed me to talk to someone. And that's I think everyone should have someone to talk to. If you don't have someone in your family, you should be seeing some sort of professional at least once a month. And even if there is someone in your family that's not a therapist or that's not a counselor, um, how could it possibly be a bad thing? For you to go and vent and let it all out and get good advice and analysis and counsel from somebody who's trained to do it. In this day and age, with everything going on, you've got to, you've got to talk. You've yeah. got to let it out. So Megan, coming up in just a little bit. Plus, we have an amazing letter from Michael, a real talker who wrote in about my recent conversation with uh, Erica Barutis, the founding president of the United Conservative Party and political scientist, Dr. Dwayne Bratt. Michael, we loved your email. That's coming up later on in the show. Oh, yeah. And the CEO of Tesla wants to drop <laughs> 41 <laughs> billion and buy twitter elon gonna, musk has an offer to buy twitter we're gonna go in on this we're gonna talk about this i think everybody seems to be talking about it um some people think it's the greatest thing of all time and some people think it's uh what was that sports illustrated feature way back in the day um today's or, or this week sign the apocalypse is yeah. upon us this could be one of them when, might be what's one he of behind them. it for 41 well he's made an offer of, of 41 yeah almost like let's call it 41 42 billion <laughs> i love i just fudged it up it's great yeah 41 <laughs> 42 billion that only difference billion. of a thousand Fine. million dollars well he's worth like what 267 billion so well you and know, there's questions about how this money would left. be financed and what it yeah. would do for his time I mean, of course, he's got huge uh, obligations with Tesla and with SpaceX as well. And people will go, well, what does this mean? What are the implications? One of the things I'm seeing a lot of buzz about is who would be first to be invited back. I think he'd queue up Donald Trump's account probably first. And yeah, and that has implications on do you want someone like that running a huge social media platform that influences the world. But I guess, is it any different than uh, Bezos owning the Washington Post? Probably not. Well, how funny is this? Uh, I've got this. I love that you just brought up the Washington Post. You didn't know I was going to show this, but this is Max Boot. Uh, Max is the editor or one of the editors of the opinions page on the Jeff Bezos owned, let's call it the Amazon owned, but technically the Jeff Bezos owned Washington Post. And Max Boot, consider the source, says, I'm frightened. He tweeted this just this morning. I'm frightened by the impact on society and politics if Elon Musk acquires Twitter. He seems to believe that on social media, anything goes, says Max. 
for democracy to survive, we need more content moderation, not less. I think we should do a whole show on this. I was just listening and reading, uh, listening to a podcast and reading some articles on just, you know, how ads and, and just, you know, conspiracy theory websites and just how we're fed everything every day is is affecting our mental health as well. Maybe your sister can touch on that today as well. Yeah, why not? Uh, let's get to it. That's a great point. Let's so go. so let, let's get started here officially. Obviously, this show happens because we have the support of amazing sponsors. Like the team at Bitcoin Well, I was in there yesterday doing some business. And of course, I went to see my man, Benny. He's not right at the front door. He's not right there waiting for you. But it, but his office is front facing. He's one of the faces of the company. And we were talking about Elon Musk. And we were talking about Pierre Polyev, okay. uh, the conservative leadership candidate, and talking about a bunch of others. And he goes, yeah, there's a lot of Bitcoin news happening. I don't want to put words in Benny's mouth, but I don't think he'd mind me sharing. He said, I said, how do you feel about the politicizing nature of this like if, if Pierre Polyev starts talking about Bitcoin then <laughs> then he goes well you know what's going to happen is one prominent liberal minister or maybe the prime minister will find a way to take a shot about Bitcoin as a conservative thing mm. or even a libertarian type movement yeah and Benny goes you could argue both sides he, he, he said it could be there's a libertarian angle to Bitcoin there's a socialist angle to Bitcoin you look what's happening in El Salvador he says I, I, I don't prefer that the conversation around Bitcoin gets politicized. I said, I know what you mean, Benny. For insights along these lines and more, I recommend the team at Bitcoin Well. Find them under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Dr. Saxinger and Markland coming up in uh, just under a half hour's time taking your COVID questions. If you have a question about COVID-19, whether it's a personal one about a family gathering, a bigger picture one about policy, whatever it is, uh, these two are a great resource and we're looking forward to talking to them. So get your questions in now. Reply to our tweet at RealTalkRJ or use that hashtag as well. We want to start today by talking about mental health. We know that many of you probably speak with a counselor, a therapist, a psychologist, what have you on a semi-regular or a regular basis. And I'm sure you would be able to tell us, you, you might be able to talk for hours about the benefits that you take from that. And then there's many others of us who, who haven't made that commitment or who haven't had that as part of our life. And there could be a whole bunch of barriers, whether it's that stigma that John Hicks and I referenced earlier today, by the way, technical producer John Hicks in the house today. I don't know that I officially introduced you. It's good to have you here with us. <laughs> for a lot of other people, it might be barriers like cost or availability. Or, or I'm sure that there are dozens of others. But if you get in a position where you make that commitment, where you, you see that there's going to be some benefit in your personal life to talking to somebody who can help you sift through, sort through, understand, and maybe better respond to some of the, the feelings you have, your emotions, the challenges around you, some external factors, <clears throat> how do you know if a counselor, a therapist is a good fit for you? My sister, Megan, is a registered clinical counselor based out of Coast Salish Territory. She specializes in working with non-traditional networks. We'll find out what that means. And individuals who've experienced trauma or abuse related to identity, religion, and expression of self. A few years ago, Megan founded a BC-wide queer-run counseling community. And I want you to make sure that you check them out online at groundingstonehealing.com. They provide anti-oppressive counseling services and workshops facilitated by a diverse group of counselors. It's a thrill to welcome my sister, Megan Jesperson, to the show. Thanks for making time for us. And a good morning to you, sister. Thanks for waking up early on the West Coast. <laughs> You're so welcome. I woke up way earlier than I needed to because my little guy got up around five this morning. So. Oh. I've been waiting for you all. Oh, I love it. That's uh, my uh, adorable, sweet, and wonderful nephew, Arrow. And, and uh, well, I'm, I'm grateful to Arrow. I, I, I planted a little notion in, in his mind. You didn't know, Megs, but I said, you make sure that Megan doesn't sleep in today. And so Arrow cooperated. I love that. Johnny and I were talking about, and I don't know if stigma is the right word. Maybe, maybe misconception is a better word, but how it seems like maybe back in the day, and I might be talking about 15 years ago or 10 years ago, uh, where people would you know, talk about a, a therapist or a counselor and, and, and friends around them or people in their circle might say, what's wrong? Are you okay? Now mm -hmm. it seems people say, I'm, you know, people sort of proclaim it. I'm going to talk to my therapist. I have my appointment with my counselor this week. It seems like people's attitudes have changed on who can benefit from this type of thing. Yeah, I think people's attitudes have certainly changed a lot. And I mean, 
I want to acknowledge that I can really only speak to my community here in um, Coast Salish territories and in, in Vancouver, where we're based out of. Um, that's my whole world, you know, for the last 10 years within counseling communities and my team at the Grounding Stone. So um, sometimes I will admit I, I've I lose sight of the fact that not everyone is involved in counseling and accesses um, therapy services. Um, there's a lot of barriers for people though, still, right? In certain cultural communities where that still is um, really not, uh, not a part of the way that people do things and the way that people manage things, right? It's uh, very private. You're talking about your private experience in the world and that's a really scary thing to open up to. And, you know, when I think about when we were kids, I don't, and I was born in 1980, I don't remember anyone talking about counseling at that time. And there would have been a big stigma attached to that. Um, but now certainly, yeah, people are coming out. There's more and more acknowledgement, like in the mainstream around counseling and talking about mental health and people who have big public platforms who are discussing their experiences within counseling, which I think gives people permission to explore it themselves. How do you know, like when you're talking to, a, say, a potential client or an existing client, how do you know if therapy or counseling would be a good fit for you? I mean, I guess you could easily just say right now, well, everybody would benefit from counseling. Sure. But, but how do you know if that's something that maybe might benefit your life or something you might need? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, um, well, something that Johnny just said, you know, his wife got him there. So, <laughs> so it was a good decision for Johnny to make, uh, for the longevity of his relationship, I right. would imagine. Um, how do you know though, in, in all honesty, some people are, are prompted by others to access counseling and, and, uh, truth be told, that's some people aren't ready for counseling. And if you enter into that relationship before you feel like a little bit open to share a little bit or explore a little bit about yourself or talk about some of the stuff that really pisses you off or stuff that um, that is really, really heavy that you don't want to carry anymore. I mean, if you're if you're not in that place with a little bit of openness yet, then maybe just giving yourself a little bit more time before you access counseling is actually supportive. Um, so I don't actually think that that everybody um, would benefit right now from entering into a counseling relationship. But um, different reasons that people access counseling. Um, I mean, I access counseling regularly. I have monthly appointments and bi-weekly if needed, but with my therapist. And the reason that I do is not only for professional growth for me, but as an individual, just to have a space where I can explore, where I can explore the evolution of who I am becoming, you know, like having, having a kid, um, my little guy is almost two and wow, that has sure opened up parts of my experience and thinking about when I was, when I was a young one that I never thought um, that I never thought about before, right? Um, the pandemic hitting, like, wow, um, everything shifting, feeling very socially isolated, that brought up stuff that as a very extroverted person, I'd never thought about before, I'd never had to encounter before, I'd never had to manage before. So sometimes it can be experiences that are like, boom, this thing happened, you know, the pandemic happened to all of us, although we all experienced it differently. Yeah. But it may be a loss that you experience, it may be just like, I want to understand more about myself. It may be like, I want to learn how to manage my stress better. And maybe I notice that I get in this pattern of conflict pretty, pretty regularly. And, and I don't want to do it anymore. It may be, I take care of everyone else all the time. This is one for me too. I'll disclose. I take care of everyone else all the time. I need some space for me to just be held. I need some space for me to share struggles that I'm having, things that are going on for me, fears that I have, frustrations that I have, without having to worry about how it's going to impact the person I'm sharing with, hmm. right? Like that is one of the biggest things, right? You said that, that I'm not your therapist. No, I'm certainly not your therapist. Um, we will avoid that dual relationship. But I was reflecting, you know, preparing to come on the show today and just in reflection about when I was a kiddo, you kind of were like, you were my confidant, like you were, you're my big brother, you're four years older than me, you were the one that I would 
go to for anything. And if I didn't go to you, you would come to me and talk through things. Didn't matter if you were living outside of the province, outside of the country. You know, we have old, what well, I was going to say, quick time chats. What were they called? The chats, oh, MSN Messenger. MSN or, Messenger, yeah. Yeah, just talking through stuff. And, and that was something that really helped me to get through some really difficult experiences that I mm. had um, growing up. But what I know now as I grow in my self-awareness, something that our relationship you and I can't offer is my feeling of wanting to protect you from my pain and wanting to downplay my experiences of marginalization um, in order to protect you. Um, when I'm talking to my therapist, I don't have to think about how she feels about it because yeah. it's her job just to hold that space for me. So it's a very different relationship. I want to ask you about what holding space means, and it might be self-explanatory, but, but, but I think that people would value that. But first, I want to touch on, I mean, how important it is to find a, a proper and healthy yeah. and a good fit relationship with a counselor, right? You, you need one who's, uh, I don't want to say whose views will align with yours because that's not necessarily uh, important, but, but one that's a good fit, and that's not necessarily the first one you're going to see on a Google search or, or maybe even the one with the highest rating or, or the one that your best friend sees, right? So, so how do you know if a counselor is a good fit? Yeah, yeah. It's a you know, multifaceted process. I, um, it, just to, I'll maybe just make a number of points that I consider. So at the Grounding Stone at our space, one of my favorite parts of the work that I do is connecting. It's not, not necessarily just my counseling, although I adore my clients. It's connecting people with counselors, networking and connecting people. So I do all of the intake at the Grounding Stone, and it's a part of the work that I absolutely love because I get these windows, these beautiful windows into people's lives, and they share with me in a 10-minute call or in a paragraph uh, what's going on for them, and I can ask a couple questions and then connect them with a counselor either within our community or outside. We refer out all the time as well. So some of the considerations that to think about, like number one, counseling is not accessible for everyone. Um, certainly not private practice, which is what we offer, right? We do offer a sliding scale, but that's not necessarily doable for everyone to pay 150 or 200 or 250 dollars a session, right? Um, so looking at if you have any counseling coverage or if there are any community programs available um, and looking at the designations that are required for that coverage. So in, um, in BC, my designation, RCC, uh, registered social workers, registered uh, psychologists in Alberta, I think you have Canadian certified counselors, registered psychologists, seeing what your coverage covers. And then if, that fin if the finances are a consideration for you in that way, helping that to guide your search. And then looking at one thing I always ask people, who do you feel safest with? Who are some of the people that you've met throughout your life who you feel safest with? Are they people with some shared identity? You know, if you're black and queer, do you feel safer working with a black queer therapist? Um, if you have a history of trauma related to Catholicism, um, do you want to work with a client who has a similar history as you? Um, that's not always easy to find because people don't list that stuff in their bios. But one thing that I will tell you is most of us list areas that we work because we have some kind of interest or lived experience or exposure to those areas. So thinking about, do you feel more comfortable working with, um, with someone who is non-binary? Do you feel comfortable working with a man or do you feel comfortable working with female counselors? Just thinking about that. Do you feel comfortable, um, with people who have a gentler kind of energy or someone who's more kind of directive. And, and that's the kind of thing that you can assess on a consultation call. So we offer free 10 minute consultation calls. Some people offer up to half an hour for consultation calls. And that's a, that's a good opportunity for you to, you know, call around to get a sense for um, who may be, who maybe kind of feels like someone that you actually kind of like, hmm. because if you're going to be sharing stuff, uh, the stuff that feels vulnerable for you being open about stuff, and people are more or less vulnerable. You don't have to be totally wide open. That's not a requirement at all of counseling. Um, you need to feel relatively able to be kind of like you can imagine feeling kind of like this person's not going to judge you. You can, you can foresee having, having you, you can foresee it happening that there may be a point where you start to spew. 
Like yeah, you start yeah, to just and, unload and let it and out. And for me, for me, like it's really important for me with the counselor who I work with to be able to drop some F bombs now and then, like when I'm really fucking upset, like mm-hmm. I need to be able to talk about that without worrying about how that might um, impact uh, her or how she may see me. I've got some uh, great feedback here that I'm seeing from our live chat. People are tuning in. Some uh, Megan, some uh, audience members joining us live streaming on YouTube right now are saying, we need this conversation. I need this conversation right now. Corey says, I've been through some emotional trauma through my life, and it got to a point where I had to see a counselor to get those issues sorted out. Tracy says, mental health services have been really lacking for several decades. Tracy, specifically talking about Alberta, says, for example, there's one counselor uh, at my daughter's high school for 900 students, which you know, yeah. is, is obviously a big deal. And a lot of other people are, are sharing stories of, of how their own counseling journey has impacted others. You know, for example, I saw that Penny left a comment here that said that there was an opportunity for her. She said, I had access to a counselor at my last job. It was on, on site at a mine, which is, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's unusual or not. That sounds pretty interesting. I, I guess maybe they're living on site, obviously, and you have a counselor there. But Penny says, I was I was very open about it with the guys, and some of them quietly started talking to the counselor because I was so open about it. That from Penny, which is pretty interesting. Megan, you talked about holding space. Um, like Technically, sort of, what does that mean? Is that, is that just the idea of a safe space, the, the idea of a set time, the idea of no prejudgment? Is, is that kind of what it means? What does that mean? What does that mean to me? Hmm. Um, I can speak for what that means to me. Um, and I'll speak from, from a therapist lens, from my therapist lens, holding space with my clients. Um, I had a, I had a session in the past couple of weeks with one of my clients who has landed on, uh, some pretty huge awarenesses around, uh, some loss that they've experienced in their life that they weren't previously aware of, um, it is such a tender and gentle time for this person. And grief is not something that we can, and when I say grief, I mean any feeling at all associated with any kind of loss at all. So that may be the loss of an idea of a life that you thought that you were gonna have. It's a very expansive definition in my mind. Um, But you can't, you, you, we live in this world. We live in this world that is, that is built around capitalism and we are valued through our productiveness and our ability to move, move through things quickly and get things done quickly. And I think in terms of our work right now that we are being, that that we are needing to do around dismantling white supremacy culture, learning to sit in a space and to just be there, to just be there and to not have anywhere that you need to go and to not have to have this resolved at the end of this 50 minute session and to not expect your client to say anything or move into anything. I think grief is a great example of how I experience holding space with clients, Mm. being there, being grounded. My clients can move in and out of their window of tolerance and become dysregulated. And I will be there regulated with them, present with them within my window of tolerance so that at any point I can help to gently bring them back to the present after they have gone somewhere that's very painful or somewhere that's very scary. Um, that's, that's an example of how I experience holding space. Um, we're talking to Megan Jesperson. If you're just joining me, yes, uh, the surname is significant. This is my younger sister. Uh, she's a, a registered clinical counselor out on the West Coast. People can check out groundingstonehealing.com to see about your counseling service. And I wouldn't describe it as a niche counseling service, but you certainly have counselors that specialize in certain fields. Um, And it's a fascinating practice, Megan, that you've built, that you have specifically um, uh, making space for LGBTQ2S plus folks, uh, specialists who counsel in areas of non-monogamy. Uh, in fetish kink and BDSM, racial and cultural identity counseling, religious trauma, neurodiversity. 
Do you see like a real emergence in the general public's awareness of their own? For example, I pick one off the top here, religious trauma. What a fascinating area. What a fascinating field. We've had um, a woman on this show before. Uh, her husband joined her at the time. They're no longer together talking about her upbringing and in what she describes as a cult and her departure from that cult. We've talked to other people about the impact that religion has had on them from an evangelical Christian background, uh, from whatever the background was. I mean, in the year and a half we've been doing this show, we've heard some amazing testimony. Uh, mm-hmm. But a specific counseling practice addressing as an example, religious trauma, is that, would, would you describe that as a relatively new field with regards to how the general public is wrapping its mind around it? Yeah, I mean, in terms of my experience and my awareness, I would say, I would say, yeah. Um, I, I have grown into my interest in working around that, and that's a part of my history as well. Um, we, have, we have folks on the team uh, with Muslim backgrounds and Jewish backgrounds and Catholic backgrounds and evangelical backgrounds. So we support uh, folks from a number of different, different areas um, and Anglican backgrounds. Um, yeah, we have that. Yeah, there's a bunch of, bunch of groups that are starting to pop up. A couple that come to mind are the Reclamation Collective and Religious Trauma Institute. And we're starting to have these big conversations and starting to really peel away um, the impacts of our our involvement in in certain religious communities, and you know, one of the, some of the things that I'm noticing is patterns that are coming up for people and kind of uh, attuning them into their awareness of the impact uh, that these communities have had. Are noticing that, wow, I I'm having a really hard time. Uh, standing up for myself. I'm having a really hard time using my own, my own brain to make decisions. Life is demanding that I survive. Life is demanding that I work my ass off in order to pay my rent and buy these groceries that are getting more and more expensive and somehow fill my tank with this gas. And, um, and I'm having a really hard time uh, engaging in daily tasks that involve knowing where my limits are, setting boundaries, speaking my truth, um, leaving abusive relationships. Um, so there's, those are just a few patterns that I've noticed have been coming up, but certainly, yeah, it's becoming, um, it's probably one of the areas that, that people are seeking counseling from us the most, I would say, probably mm. religious trauma and um, neurodiversity as well is an area that more and more folks are starting to reach out, um, you know, talking about their experiences around um, ADD, ADHD, hmm. you know, on the autism spectrum. Yeah. And, and, and the ways that those, those identities to talking about intersectional identities, um, the overlap of, I mean, I went to this amazing conference for the last two days called Queering Mental Health that was put on by an awesome organization called Our Landing Place based out of the Maritimes. And um, they had uh, folks talking all about the intersection or the, the relationship that they've been noticing that's been coming up more and more in research for some people who are neurodiverse and um, diverse gender identities, which is, which is really, really interesting. And it's really, really exciting to start to normalize uh, some of these people's experiences. Uh, Adventure Cycling tuning in on our live chat says Megan nails it when she talks about just sitting in quiet and figuring out who we really are and what are our values. Uh, Amber uh, Amber actually, Amber Cannon joined us on the show uh, a while ago, courageously talking about her own journey living with bipolar disorder and her interactions with police and being form 10 and 911 response to mental health crises. And uh, if, if, if Real Talkers missed that interview, you've got to go back in our podcast or YouTube archive and find it. Amber says, OMG, dysregulated. That word resonated with her, Megan. She says, that's me in a nutshell. Charlotte mm-hmm. says, trained mental health counselors should be available from kindergarten to grade 12. My father died, says Charlotte, when she was in junior high school. Charlotte, sorry for your loss. She says the guidance counselor was well-meaning, but did not have the training for it. Crystal says, what an amazing conversation. The more counseling becomes a social norm, we'd have much, a much healthier world. Imagine everybody feeling safe and working through their challenges and emotions. Crystal just hits the nail on the head there. Uh, Megan, we could keep you here for an hour and a half, but the fact is, real life calls, and you have a ferry to catch. And so we're going to thank you for your time, sister. People want to learn more about what you're doing, in particular, real talkers that are out on the West Coast. 
but of course, across Canada, around the world, you can check out groundstonehealing.com uh, and learn more about Megan's counseling and community there. Megan Jesperson, I couldn't be more proud of you, sister. I love you very much. Thanks for talking right. to us. I love you too, brother. Thanks, everyone. You got it. Uh, okay. You can let me know what you thought about that. Talk at ryanjesperson.com. Can you tell why I'm so proud of my siblings? Uh, Megan included, uh, just an amazing human being who cares very deeply about her her partners uh, in business and in real life and, and of course, uh, real talkers. She is a uh, member of this community and, and catches the show all the time, and it's a real honor to bring her here. We're going to be checking in with Drs. Lenora Sachsinger and uh, Darren Markland coming up in just a little bit. They'll be taking your COVID questions. We're getting a whole bunch of them. Um, it's best for us if we can go to one source to look for your questions. So if you're doing this live, um, go ahead and tweet them at us at Real Talk RJ, or you can use the hashtag Real Talk RJ as well. Uh, your COVID questions coming up in just a little bit. I want to remind you right now, if you are uh, one of those Canadians particular in western canada that is looking for a sunnier locale for a while you're going to get out of here you're sick of the wind you're seeing that storm in saskatchewan you see that the saskatchewan just we got to chat about chin. that later yeah it's L- let's, let's get like what was it like 80 centimeters or something like that point is if you're going wheels up and flying out of edmonton's international airport out of eia we recommend at real talk that you go with jet set airport parking you'll find them online at jetsetparking.com and you can save a ton of cash by booking online right now you book your spot at jetsetparking.com you want to leave at least 24 hours ahead of your departure to make your booking so do it today you can book for travel all the way through to the end of the year all the way through to the end of 2022 and the promo code real talk is going to get you parking at EIA in Jet Set for $7 a day. That's right, $7 a day parking with the promo code REALTALK at jetsetparking.com. Our friends at Kubi Energy want to remind you that they're doing business solar installations, I mean, year-round, but especially now that they can send everybody up on the roof safely across Alberta and BC. They're headquartered out of Edmonton and Kamloops, which means basically... If you've got a goal to go more sustainable, you want to save a little money, you want to green up your business, your residence, maybe your industrial complex or your farm, you can get a free quote today at kubienergy.ca. You can also learn more under the blog section on their website about some of the the subsidies that are available, the rebates, the ways that you can get solar for even less expenditure than you might think. Check them out today at kubienergy.ca. Don't forget to send us your positive reflection presented by Kubi Energy. John, we take the long weekend, stay with our families through the Easter break, which means we'll be back on next Tuesday. Yeah. That means we'll have positive reflections plus the leading edge. Amazing. By leading edge physiotherapy on one day. It's going to be a very positive Tuesday. Uh, Got a couple great guest book for that show as well. And of course, our friends at Local Environmental, well, they've got a feature coming up tomorrow. That's Trash Talk, where you have a chance to get something off your chest. We've already got a couple based on interviews we've done this week, which is the greatest engagement. Local Environmental keeps it local. Some people say it's only garbage, but not to them. They believe that communities deserve better, better service, better prices, more support for local causes. Swing by localenvironmental.ca today to see how they can help you achieve your goals. Well, before we go any further, you want, you want to talk to, do we have, do we have any photos or images of the Saskatchewan storm? This was absolutely wild. I, it is two, over two and a half feet. If, if people don't know, 80 centimeters, it's a lot of snow. I know like in Western Canada, we, we should brace our, not just Western Canada. I should show some respect to our, to our fellow Canadians in Quebec and Ontario that see their fair share and out on the Maritimes, those big storms too. But you almost yeah. brace yourself in April. You know, you see the one neighbor, look at these images. If you're listening on the podcast, it's basically snow up to the windshields on cars parked in the street. Yeah. Uh, but these are, you know, there's always that one person on the street that's getting the early gardening done. They're always the first <laughs> yeah. one on the block. And I sit there and, I, and I, I'm not always right. Not yet. Not but yet. Sometimes I am. I sit there and go, I think we're probably going to get one more big one. <laughs> one more big wallop. Well, yeah, people are on the streets are digging their cars out. And uh, yeah. Wow. Shout out to Saskatchewan. A lot of people are wondering if that's going to be heading our way. Uh, we have a storm of emails. I tried. To our inbox, talk at ryanjesperson.com. And that includes this one from Michael. We received this yesterday. Uh, I love this. You know, every once in a while, actually on a fairly regular basis, we'll get an email from somebody that listened to an interview that happened 
a few days ago or sometimes a couple of weeks ago because we know that your time is so valuable and we appreciate every single minute that you invest in Real Talk. You may remember I talked to Erica Barutis. Uh, she's the founding president of the United Conservative Party. Uh, she's a strategist, now a political strategist, uh, and of course politically engaged, as is Dwayne Bratt. Uh, Dr. Brad, a professor of political science at Mount Royal University out of Calgary, both of them talking to us about Jason Kenney's leadership review and his address to party members in Red Deer over the weekend. Michael caught it and he said, uh, hi, Ryan, and welcome, John, he says to the team. Uh, just listening to Baroudis and Brat, he says, I have high regard for Dwayne Bratt, so I'm always eager to listen when he comes on your show or when he speaks elsewhere. But I was a little reluctant, says Michael, to give Ms. Baroudis a chance uh, since she is heavily associated with my enemy party. Michael says, I am definitely an overcaffeinated lefty. Michael says, once again, you have found an excellent guest who defies my preconceived notions. Michael says, although she and I would fundamentally disagree on most matters of policy, her takes on the subject discussed came across as fair and reasonable which is a rarity for UCPers, in my opinion. Michael getting his little shot in there. He says she made such an excellent point about how the UCP did not do a good job of onboarding MLAs and party members to the idea of governing versus simply opposing. And I believe that she was alluding to former Wild Rosers who have demonstrated pretty remarkable lack of awareness on how to function as a cohesive government. I think that's a fair point Michael makes. And Erica made the same point, like he says. Writes Michael, this concept completely resonates with how they behave. And she also wasn't afraid to state the obvious and to speak openly about fractures in the party leading to a potential splinter party. It was so refreshing to hear an honest assessment from a party insider that small C conservatives might consider voting for the Alberta party. A great guest, as usual. I am totally opposed to her political views, but very intrigued to hear what she has to say and so impressed with her truthful takes. That from Michael. That's pretty excellent feedback, and I appreciate that. Now, Michael, you know uh, when you have your email read here on the show, it goes into the hopper as uh, one to be considered for our email of the month. And every month, we award a Real Talk Studio Issue mug. One of these, these we, we call them our Crescent mugs. Uh, these are the ones used in studio, as you can see on the backside, keeping it real since 2020. On the front, our logo, Real Talk, Ryan Jesperson. And once a month, we'll pick an email that really resonated with us, that inspired conversation with the audience, and we'll send that to you from our shipping headquarters down in beautiful Calgary, Alberta. If you want to get your hands on a mug ahead of time, you don't want to try to compete with the emails. You want to just get one of these mugs into your collection. You can always go to Ryan jesperson.com and click on merch and find it there following other stories of the day today and that includes of course elon musk's proposed takeover some are describing it as a hostile takeover of twitter i'm not sure that that that's necessarily the case right now he's made an offer anyway which experts would say well that's kind of how hostile takeovers work but 41 billion dollars uh, which has prompted a spike in shares of the social media giant elon musk does this all the time right you think of dogecoin and he talks about Dogecoin and how he's a big fan of it. And uh, boom, it goes up. And then boom, it goes up. And then what does he do? He liquidates all his Dogecoin and he makes yeah. a whole bunch of money. Uh, crazy like a fox is Elon Musk. And a lot of people are saying right now, well, you wonder what might happen here. He owns 9% of the company. He mm -hmm. turned down an invitation to sit on the board. Mm -hmm. And many are speculating today it's because you can hold a maximum of up to 15% of the company if you're going to be on the board and he wants more than that hmm. so that sort of maybe shines some light on why he said no to the board appointment or the invitation to the board but but many people are saying the offer price of 41 billion and change represents about 54 dollars 20 cents per share that's a 38 percent jump almost a 40 percent premium to twitter's april 1st close which was the last trading day before Elon Musk's stake in Twitter was made public. Wow. Okay. So April 1st, so let's say March 31st, nobody knows that Elon Musk owns almost 10% of the company, owns 9% uh -huh. of the company. Nobody knows. It's announced the next day, and less than two weeks later, shares are up almost 40%. He's such a strategist that way. And is it right or is it wrong? How do you, like, how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, I guess it depends on what his motivation is, but it strikes me as somewhat disingenuous. Very. Right? Very opportunistic. Um, I think that a lot of people, you know, if you want to use these altcoins as an example, mm. 
uh, you know, let's talk about Dogecoin. If, if somebody admires Elon Musk or thinks that he's brilliant or, you know, I, I do think he's brilliant. You can't tell me you're putting rockets into space and inventing electric vehicles and you're not smart. Yeah. You may not like him, but he's smart. Yeah. Uh, he may not be your cup of tea for sure. But if he in, so, so much as endorses something like Dogecoin and then a bunch of people spend their hard earned money to buy it and then he just cashes bails. out, he bails on it. Yeah. Uh, that seems like kind of a weird thing to me. I don't like it. So I don't know what the implications would be for Twitter if he were to own the whole thing. Uh, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, Donald Trump would be the first one back. Maybe. But that's kind of that's kind of like one storyline. Mm. That might be what you might call a symptom of something else. Uh, I saw Linda Steele, who joined us on the show yesterday, legendary broadcaster. Lots of love for Linda. Make Amazing. Sure you check out that interview yeah. if you missed it. Cost of living in B.C., parents with Alzheimer's. I mean, she was an open book. Uh, she tweeted today, uh, Twitter would be an even bleaker and more angry place, if you can imagine that. I tend to agree with her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our next two guests uh, have, have been wonderful friends of this show through the course of the pandemic from the earliest stages when we were trying to make sense of it, but from from how contagious COVID-19 was. And then what, what are these variants all about and these different waves and how should we be managing this? And and how do we know if it's OK to send our kids to school and do masks work or not? And is hand sanitizer actually effective? And all of the questions as research and as our public awareness has advanced, uh, so has continued the commitment of these two physicians, these two healthcare professionals to keep us in the loop and understanding what we need to know most. I saw them interacting on Twitter just the other day with one another, and it prompted this invitation. And I'm so grateful that Dr. Darren Marklin and Dr. Lenora Saxinger have agreed to join us this morning. Uh, Dr. Saxinger, an infectious diseases doctor, you, you see her, uh, you see both of them, quite frankly, on all the national news broadcasts. Uh, Darren Markland, uh, the good doctor, an ICU physician and nephrologist, or, or maybe you'll want to clarify on that because I know you've taken some steps recently with your personal and professional life, uh, always an open book. And Dr. Markland, we should note on the heels of a night shift. And so I don't know if you have toothpicks propping those eyes open, but we sure appreciate you staying up to talk to us this morning. How are you doing? How are you holding up? I'm good. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I got into this job because I have the superpower of being able to uh, survive on four hours of sleep. It's paid off. Yeah. Well, we, we promise we'll only keep you for 17 minutes uh, and, and then we'll let you go. We appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Saxinger, this is, uh, I guess I was, I was sharing with my wife the other day, we were talking, I said, I don't know where it would have put me mentally if in February or March of 2020, I would have known that two years later, we'd be talking about a sixth wave how are you holding up from the professional side of this interview requests your own personal practice i mean this has been a long haul if we've ever seen one i think myself and colleagues are, are all kind of feeling it for sure i'd have to say that uh yeah it's just real grind everyone's exhausted tanks are running low and, and part of it is just the constant attention right i mean there's been waxing and waning numbers and intensity but the attention has had to be sustained because we're still trying to learn our way out of this and that that's been a real challenge honestly yeah i uh i'm just so uh I, I can empathize with people that are having a difficult time right now because they have vulnerable family members or because they have so many considerations at play that they're just wanting to make the right decision we've got questions for you from audience members we want to put those in front of you but before we do i want to get into your twitter exchange the two of you and dr markland we'll get you to tee it up first you offered a controversial take on sunday <laughs> Uh, COVID, you say, regardless of disease severity, causes significant and diffuse organ injury. Repeated infections will likely amplify these effects. There are no studies to assess long-term physiological outcomes of this. And then you talk about Paxlovid. You say this medication should be offered to anyone infected. Can you tee this up and then we'll get you and Dr. Saxinger to go back and forth so we can better understand it? Like everything, I'm going to preface this with, I am an intensive care physician. Uh, I am not, a, I'm not a virologist or an infectious disease specialist. And uh, I'm not cow dying. I'm, I'm telling you the honest truth. What I am is, is very observant. And it's a funny take for an intensive care doctor to be talking about long-term sequela and basically social health and long-term consequences. But when I look at my population, um, what I deal with both as an intensive care and previously as a nephrologist are the complications of chronic diseases. They are incredibly morbid and they're incredibly expensive. And with this evol evolution of knowledge with this virus, um, we started off with um, understanding that it was a respiratory virus and running down that road. 
but our, our, our knowledge is expanding to, to know that this is now kind of an infectious vasculitis, the disease of blood vessels. And like so many of the chronic diseases which affect our population in the first world, blood vessel diseases are bad things. They cause strokes, heart disease, kidney failure, uh, and brain failure. And so from the day that we knew that uh, sense of smell was affected, we had an inkling that this was gonna cause some significant neurologic things too. So my big fear uh, is that this disease uh, in a year or maybe two uh, will start to manifest in increasing chronic diseases that were potentially uh, preventable. And when we talk about long COVID or post ICU syndromes or post COVID syndromes, uh, we definitely know that vaccinations are probably the most powerful things to prevent it. And that's related to the reduction of infection severity and possibly due to the, the reduction of viral load. And so that's where the postulate is. There are diseases out there that if we don't treat, for example, you know, um, strep, if not treated uh, in certain circumstances can lead to long-term outcomes. Maybe we should be shifting our, our idea to prophylaxis or prevention of long-term sequela by treating these drugs that were sold to us as ways of getting out of this pandemic and restoring our life to a, an assemblance of normal. Dr. Saxinger, your thoughts on it? I actually really don't have much to disagree with there. I think that our, but as I often do, I make everyone angry. Um, <laughs> I just kind of doing this like super pragmatic reality check. Thing. Right. So, check. I mean, honestly, um, my reality check is that in fact, I, I actually think we absolutely should be really working towards earlier therapies. I think that that could actually really blunt any long-term consequences and that actually needs to be studied well. Um, and that, you know, the early treatment actually really does reduce the risk of progression to severe disease. And when we have this rip roaring transmission going on, that's an important thing to scale up and make available. And we do have doses in Alberta and our distribution system, which has been actually in place for February and March, hadn't been really getting a lot of attention and a lot of business, honestly. Um, potentially because people didn't know how to negotiate the system and didn't realize that people at higher risk could still get tested and that getting tested is the way into the treatment uh, realm. The, the reality check is, is basically that Paxlovid is a very tightly controlled amount of drug available. And so the federal government actually had been buying a lot of different things on spec, hoping that it would be useful. And actually we're in a not bad position compared to a lot of countries in terms of having Paxlovid available, but it's getting sent out and allocated as quickly as it's being made right now. And so in the short to medium term, um, I mean, I had just done the thread about the incredibly varied provincial approaches to making this medication available. Um, it really is being targeted to people who are at the highest risk of hospitalization. Do I actually think that we'd be in a place where, you know, we'd be trying to treat COVID you know, with a much lower threshold? Absolutely. I guess the only other thing I would add is that, you know, we are in a very different place than we were several waves ago. It's really sad that I'm saying that. Um, in that we don't really know whether post-vaccine breakthrough infection is going to have the same consequences. There's some early data suggesting that, you know, a lot of the complications that we're very worried about, that Dr. Markland was talking about, do appear to be significantly blunted um, by you know, having had vaccine. You have a leg up on the infection and those consequences might not be so severe. And so it is something to keep an eye on. And I, and I do want people who are vaccinated to at least realize that it's, it's plausible that they're protected against some of those really fearsome sounding consequences and that we're gonna be continuing to learn. In the meantime, Preventing it is definitely a very, very good idea. And getting your third dose, getting tested early if you have criteria for potential treatment, um, which you know people have to actually be a little bit aware of those, and getting treatment if it's right for you. There are drug interactions and things. So I mean, it it is a it is a practical issue right now. But I do think that the direction that we're talking about is actually the same. Mm. Uh, do I, am I understanding or picking up on what you're saying? I hesitate to even put this out loud, 
But are you saying that for many people, uh, especially those that have received the, the two vaccines and their boosters, that the consequences, the physical short and long term consequences of COVID may not be as severe as before? Yeah, I mean, like, I think that is a plausible hypothesis. That's something that we have to confirm. But there is a fair amount of early data that in the Omicron wave, there's a lot of people who are asymptomatic. Um, there are people who have symptoms and their recovery can range from being really quick to actually more prolonged. It's not uncommon for people to feel draggy for a period of time. And we really don't yet have data on those longer term kind of blood vessel immunologic um, storm type consequences. Uh, and even, you know, early data on on longer term symptoms like long COVID, pre-long COVID symptoms is a little reassuring too. So. So it's always treading this kind of place where you don't want to overcall data, you don't want to overcall undercall data, and you also don't want to over or undercall um, fear and reassurance. It's really a difficult space right now because there's a lot of things changing. Dr. Markland, what are you seeing in the ICU? I, I was talking to somebody yesterday that that said as far and, and it's tough because there's not as much testing going on. People don't know the numbers. People don't know the status. A year ago, if you asked Folks, the average person on the street, how many active cases of COVID there were, or how many Albertans were in the ICU, or how many Canadians, they could probably give you a ballpark answer. The numbers were everywhere. Everybody was aware. Now it seems like they're not. And I'm hearing from some people that are, that are saying COVID's really bad right now. Like it's maybe arguably worse right now or more prevalent right now than it was in December. And I'm going, well, you wouldn't know it if you look around. And I'm even looking at my own personal behaviors. You know, I'll say, I'll keep it real. I went yesterday into a store. I wasn't wearing a mask. I looked around the person to the right of me, mask, left me, mask. I asked that important question in life. Am I the asshole? Right. People are asking these questions like, so what are you seeing in the ICU? Uh, I think what I'm seeing is uh, the results of a general disinformation campaign that's kind of provincially led here. Uh, hmm. Literally, um, when people come in with COVID infections, they're shocked. They don't believe it. Uh, in fact, they assume that it's influenza, which coincidentally is spreading now too as we withdraw on masks. Uh, people believe in their governments. There's a there is a majority of people there who say that now that these mandates have been listed, lifted, COVID is over. And as a result, we are seeing uh, what we know through wastewater data is incredibly high numbers of this. And what that is complicating, and this is why I am so concerned, is that I feel the general population of the health is significantly worse than we were two and a half years ago. Um, this whole idea of is it COVID or is it a symptom that's brought on by COVID means nothing to me when you're taking a limited resource, which is an ICU bed. So I see people come in with new onset diabetes, young people who have had COVID previously. I see new asthmatics who come in. Uh, it's complicated by the fact that we're in the middle of uh, a very unpublicized opiate toxicity crisis right now that's taking up beds and killing young people left and right. All of this is a function of disinformation. And so this is what's driving me a little nuts is that we have wanted this news. We will accept it because it's good news. But the reality is that COVID is the new genital herpes, right? You know, don't see, don't tell, but it's out there. It causes problems and it affects all aspects of healthcare, complicated by, by the fact that we've lost a lot of healthcare staff, primary providers, and uh, people are just generally missing diagnoses and presenting late to hospitals with advanced symptoms. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Saxinger, when, when, when Markland on Sunday said, of course, we could always just reinstate mask bylaws and vaccine mandates, which are cost effective and proven, but no one will buy into that. You, you weren't convinced that that would be the right move. How come? Uh, you know, I'd have to look at what I said, but I think. Do you want me to read it to you? Well, no, I think that I think <laughs> I'm pretty sure I said I wouldn't have stopped them. That's right. You did. Um, because I mean, they, I don't actually understand why, I don't think there's a huge pressure to stop things that are, you know, part of a layered protection campaign when we're in an uncertain and evolving time that like looks likely based on experience elsewhere to probably potentially get worse. And that that's what's happened. Um, you know, the, there is a lot of uncertainty as to how much all of the layers add. And I think that it is it is unlikely to see these things come back into play as long as there's both that uncertainty and also these entrenched polarized positions. And so, again, I, I make people angry when I just kind of say, this is what I see, but, but that doesn't mean I'm actually necessarily endorsing what I see. I'm just saying, this is what I see. And I, and I do think it's unlikely that they would come back in for those reasons, because of the polarization, because of the, the lack of 
outcome-based certain data that is really what people are, decision makers tend to set as a bar is like, can you tell me without any shred of a doubt that if we do this, we will have this much benefit is kind of the conversation I think that has been happening worldwide. And we're often not in a position to be able to do that. And, um, and that's regrettable because I actually think it's perfectly reasonable to take precautions when things are doing, going badly. It's like, if I wear my bike helmet, could I still get hit by a car and have a fatal head injury? Yes. Should I still wear my bike helmet? Right. Absolutely. Yes. You know, I just, I just don't understand why there is why there is um, this this drive to drop things that no, no matter if they're you know a well proven exact percentage benefit or a part of a layered prevention benefit, so it, it is difficult and and I do think that especially in provinces where there's a lot of polarized opinion, trying to get the genie back in the bottle is a lot harder than just kind of keeping things. Um, in place and a really gradual, gradual approach to changing them when in fact they, they were pretty tolerable. People were managing very well. It was, it was not that burdensome. And I, and I really do think that that's an unfortunate shift because when you see people going around without masks, it kind of feeds into this notion that it's not a big deal anymore. Yeah. And aren't paying as much attention. And so that messaging is actually kind of damaging. Yeah, I put a mask on when I went to the grocery store right after, for what it's worth. I know I did, and, but you know what, dogs? It, it was it was actually it was peer pressure in a good way, and it was just I I just it, I like made an impromptu decision. I roll into Canadian Tire to grab something real quick, and then and then I and I I honestly had that moment. I felt I was like I I kind of think I'm part of the problem right now, and I and I think that that's a good thing actually. I was also like I hope nobody recognizes me, but then my inner self said I should lash myself here on the show and recognize that we all have room to grow. We're talking to Drs. Lenora Saxinger and uh, Dr. Darren Markland to your questions, Real Talkers, in one minute. First, I want to let you know that this interview is presented by sponsors that include Eden Landscaping. You can find them online right now at landscapeedmonton.ca. They know that urban front yards are challenging, right? The cookie cutter layout, the strip of grass with that one single lonely tree that maybe got planted three years ago and it's going to look great in 30 years from now, but not right now. Outdoor spaces are meant to be good for your soul. Ask them today about their urban butterfly yard approach. It's a landscape that respects local plant species and important pollinators that require habitats. You can check out all of their services, including edible garden boxes, too, at landscapeedmonton.ca. And if your family is preparing for Passover, if you're celebrating Easter this month, uh, we recommend that you visit Friesen Brothers to take the pressure off to leave more time to socialize with your loved ones. Perhaps you're gathering small units together as a family, or maybe you're looking to head out and have somebody else do all the cooking. Friesen Brothers has their team of Red Seal chefs with a whole bunch of options in 16 Alberta communities. You can find them online right now at Friesen.com. Uh, Dr. Lenora Saxinger, Dr. Darren Markland, our guests. Uh, we're taking your questions to our Twitter account at RealTalkRJ, including this one from Corrine. Uh, for the doctors, she says, after being out of my school for three months, I'm headed back into a maskless elementary school after Easter break. If I'm essentially the only one masked with a KN95, what can I really do to avoid this virus or can I? Lenora? <laughs> Uh, this actually goes to some other things I've been thinking. It, I mean, uh, a well-fitting polypropylene mask, like a, a well-fitting KN95, KN some of them are not that great, but if it's a well-fitting KN95, does reduce your risk. And the estimates of the reduction of risk vary from like 15 to 60%. Um, and of course, that risk reduction is something that you know occurs as a new roll of the dice every time you're exposed. And so can you still get infected wearing such a mask? Yes, you can. If you're maximally vaccinated, not vaccinated, and you're wearing your mask, um, you know your your odds of severe disease remain very, very low. And not everyone will be infected. But if you are infected, in spite of that, I also think there should be no stigmatization. Honestly, one thing is that in the school settings, I think there has been really widespread low symptom infection and also symptomatic infection. And so. The, the activity in schools might actually be on a downturn now, but we don't have great data. So I would just kind of keep up the precautions. And, uh, and I, I guess I have a question, though, is I, I thought that it was still discretionary mask use in schools. Mm. And my impression was that in our setting anyway, we were still seeing a lot of kids choosing to wear them. I'm, so I'm, I'm not sure. 
actually where this person comes from. Yeah, anecdotally, our little guy in his grade one class tells us that there's three kids that are wearing masks in the class right now. Three kids and the teacher in a, in a class of you know, 25 or 30 students. Uh, this one from Mike. Maybe, uh, Darren, you can take this one. says, uh, good morning, doctors. I'm, I'm three times mRNA vaccinated, third dose in December, 12 days post-positive PCR test, still testing positive on the rapid test, but feeling fine. Mike wonders, how contagious am I now, and how long will my so-called natural immunity last? Well, if your rat test is positive, that that suggests that there is still nucleocapsid in you. Uh, nucleocapsid is the, the uh, antigen that most rat tests that are proprietary test that would suggest virus is still around, but there are situations where that's negative. The provincial guidelines are five days. Uh, that's bullshit. Um, but you should probably, you know, if you look at averages based on Omicron data, we were looking at seven to 10 for clearance. Um, I would say, you know, if, if you can err on the side of uh, caution, uh, and if your rat's positive and you can stay home, stay home. PCR is going to stay positive for a long time because that's viral DNA and that sticks around for a while. Uh, and it's a very sensitive test. But uh, rat to exit strategies are some of the things that are out there and seem to be the safest. They're very sensitive, but they have lower specificity of viral clearance. So the long story is, if you can afford to, and you you want to be maximally careful not to infect somebody who may be immunosuppressed, um, it, if your rat is negative, then you are definitely clear. Otherwise, it goes down to more individual judgment. Mm. Dr. Saxinger, this one from uh, a Twitter account, Silent Majority. Uh, and if you want to add to what Darren had to say, I'd love that as well. Uh, this this question wonders, uh, fourth doses for everyone? Uh, anything about may maybe a revised plan to the vaccines for, for new variants? Do we know when the so-called universal COVID vaccine may come? Okay, so fourth doses do add an incremental benefit, but it's actually a very small increment compared to the really whopping benefit of the third dose. The third dose does a lot of heavy lifting in preventing severe disease. And even with a third dose, it doesn't prevent infection all that well. It's kind of middling against infection, but the hospitalization protection goes from in the realm of 50 to 70% after two doses um, or even lower up to 90% and greater. So third dose is the priority and we have pretty low third dose vaccination across the board because I think people just weren't recognizing the urgency. So I think, you know, the, the parallel campaign would be really get the third dose update up. Um, fourth doses will need to be rolled out, especially for people at higher risk, because we do see third doses occasionally coming in with severe disease and that, you know, more compromised population, most of whom had their third dose early. And so I think it should probably follow the time, same timeline. There's a number of different vaccines under development that should provide broader protection, but none of them are really kind of prime time yet. And so at the moment, we're playing with the same vaccines and updated formulations of the vaccines. Over the summer, there might be some new uh, mRNA vaccines that are more geared towards variants available. It's not clear yet how much effectiveness they will add, but one would expect some. Um, I can't remember the last question, but there was a few in there. Yeah, and, and then uh, th this universal COVID vaccine and, and, and sort of the prognosis on that or the timeline. Yeah, that's um, I, so that's still more or less preclinical work. And um, people are trying to figure out if we are needing to look for things like mucosal immunity. Maybe it'll be a nasal vaccine. Maybe it'll be a different target for the vaccine. And so there's a lot of really promising developments, but they're not really prime time. And I, I do have to emphasize that the speed with which we got these vaccines is actually amazing. And it might have set a really high bar um, when we're looking at developing truly new vaccines that will be broader. And so... I mean, there's only so fast things can move, and I think that they're moving along well. Yeah. And I just to add one comment on the rapid antigen test mm -hmm. um, uh, commentary, which is, I mean, there's new, the question of whether a rapid test is reflecting transmissible virus has been really, really an important one. And it is pretty clear that early in infection, a positive rat really does correlate quite well with higher amounts of viable virus. Towards the end of the infection, that actually becomes a lot rockier. And so there are some studies, smaller ones, just coming out showing that you can actually be rat positive and not have virus that you're able to grow. And then the third thing is that does a viable virus actually mean that you're transmitting? And in a lot of studies, most of the transmission is early on. And so, you know, making sure that you're isolating very, very carefully early in infection is, is where a lot of the transmission happens. And in Omicron, the, uh, the serial interval is like two, three days. 
So from the index case getting symptoms to their contacts getting symptoms is really, really short. So we think that a lot of the transmission is front loaded. I do, however, agree that five days is very short. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that most people should be isolated until their symptoms are well resolving and kind of more out to 10 days. Well, I'm sure not an infectious diseases doctor like you are, but I know that if I was sitting next to somebody in a restaurant that told me they'd tested positive five days ago, I'd probably be pretty uncomfortable. I can tell you that much just as an anecdotal statement, Darren. And there's an addendum here too, right? So what Dr. Saxinger tells us, right? And what is tough about this is that uh, pre, pre-symptoms, so you're, you're infectious probably before you have these symptoms, means that we have to redefine how we live, right? And that's, these are big topics that nobody wants to do. So, you know, when you're going to your, to your restaurant, walk in the front door and look at what the CO2 monitor says. Oh, wait, there isn't one. Right. But if you want to talk about ventilation, it is a very important aspect of societal control of this virus. Good ventilation is a really important aspect to this. So if you want to protect yourself when you're going to school, advocate for better HVAC, um, advocate for better air clearance, start to learn about that stuff, right? The hand sanitizing thing was where we started. People wash their spinach. That really is a minor component of this, but clean air is a big part. And it's something that we can incorporate into building codes and into our lifestyles as well. Mm. Uh, doctors, I've got to let you go. I respect your time so much, Darren. I know it's been a long night for you. I want to ask, just ask you this in closing. Everybody wants to make the right decision. I was talking to a and he calls himself this, you know, a right wing conservative friend of mine who's very upset with Alberta's premier right now because he thinks Jason Kenney did too much. Uh, the other day he told me why he's splitting away from the party or considering it. He says, well, that's because Jason Kenney canceled Christmas. And I went, well, and now people are talking about Ramadan and Passover and Easter and everybody just wants to make the right decision. So in closing. Can I just ask for some real talk on what, I mean, you're going to say, I know you got to make the decision that's right for you, right? Uh, be aware of your surroundings, but, but maybe a closing thought, maybe Dr. Saxinger, you first in the context of making the right decision right now. I would think if people have not had a booster or infection in the last three months, they're at really quite high risk of infection if, if they're in contact and there's a really high risk of contact right now. And so, you know, doing the things to limit your network number. So just, you know, pick the highest impact positive interactions of low number um, and making sure that you pay attention to who's there. So if there's people who are at high risk of severe disease, take extra precautions. And again, that rule of thumb, which is you know probably as inaccurate or accurate as anything else would be if you haven't been infected or haven't been boosted in the last three months, um, be extra, extra cautious because it really is incredibly high transmission right now. And, and a lot of people are getting, you know, ill not too severely but it is still finding the under vaccinated the unlucky and people who are at high risk by virtue of their medical con conditions and i really worry about that last group especially mm. dr markland do we still have darren yeah there don't we. be a turd get your third <laughs> uh, if you really do care make sure there's clean air that needs, is that on a t-shirt already or does that just need to be on one Somewhere out there is going to put it on a t-shirt. I Hopefully think so. Not with my big bald head on it. Oh yeah, geez, give me a break. Am I, am I allowed to ask you about the other? You're you're, you're about to do a, a a fundraising thing. Can I ask you about this, or am I going to blow the doors off it before we're supposed to, Doctor Markland? You know what I'm talking about. It's out there on Twitter, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. No. So as you probably know, I ride my bike a lot, and uh, I'm influenced by beauty. So. You know, I'm in the presence of two beautiful people, uh, but uh, I take pictures of landscapes and I throw them out there so people have something to look at when they're feeling down. And the beauty of social media is sometimes you find people who uh, who take those things and make them into, into bigger things. So I've always done this for free, but someone has has uh, manipulated the artist out there and is going to turn them into large campuses for auctions so that the proceeds can go to help uh, the people in Ukraine. Amazing. So I know you're officially launching that on Tuesday, and so we'll give that project another shout-out on Tuesday, but I, I wanted to get you on the record on it uh, so we don't have to get you to stay up late one more time to talk to us within a one-week period. Uh, you'll start saying no. We're so grateful for both of you. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing to keep us informed. That's Dr. Lenora Saxon your Dr. Darren Markland right here on Real Talk. Take care. Thanks. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, apologies to those of you we didn't get to your questions. We tried to take the ones along those sort of thematic lines that we could and have the doctors uh, wax on them. Uh, <laughs> Hope is chiming in on the rhyming, says, don't be a bloke, go get your poke. 
I don't think blokes have been. Blokes, isn't that? Hey, the blokes? It's the UK, right? Yeah. yeah, don't be a bloke. Well, you can be a bloke. What's wrong with the blokes? No, I like it, though. Sometimes we work hard to rhyme. I, I can, I can uh, certainly uh, connect with that. Uh, I love this. Isabel says, I truly appreciate you, Dr. Markland. Your Twitter feed is one of the few I trust. Trust, such an important word on this, yeah. right? We heard the feedback from people when we announced that these two, yesterday we announced they'd be joining us today. Mm-hmm. That was a word that kept coming up recurring. That these are voices that they have trusted through this. Yeah, they seem very. They're very. They're very calm. They explain things very well. And I, I did. I took a look at uh, Saxinger's uh, Twitter last night and Markland's. Very, very uh, robust information that isn't like, it's not being forced on you. And mm-hmm. they have a good range. It's. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't seem to be in one category. So. Yeah, I, I had a, I was so looking forward to that interview. Today. I liked her comment. And it delivered. About, yeah, and <laughs> well, and because now I mean I think people, and I find myself uh, in this position on a regular basis. Where, like I told you, a friend, the other day, saying COVID's like it's bad right now. It is. She says it's really bad right now. Like it's it's arguably as bad or even worse than it was in December. But it seems like everyone's kind of just doing their thing. Well, and, like you uh, said. We go out and the narrative is that it's over, right? Yeah. I, I do the same thing. I Most places, I'll be honest, I go without a mask. But I do like you. If I see other people around me, keep it in my pocket, I throw it on because... You know, just trying to be respectful. I kind of, yeah, I had my me. moment yesterday. I was like, what am I doing? Yeah. Just put it, what are you doing? <laughs> put it back on. If I've got it in my pocket, it goes on. But so. at the same time, you know, it was, it was my birthday on Monday. My wife and I went out for a nice dinner. It was nice to get back into a restaurant. 100%. Uh, t- to be honest with you, for, for the purposes of the restaurant tour, of the entrepreneur that owns that restaurant, who mm-hmm. we've got a lot of respect for, it was great to see the place busy. Sure. But it also feels kind of weird. Takes some getting used to, right? So we always want to know where you're at on this Real Talkers. Uh, your feedback helps us shape the editorial direction of the show, and you know how you can send us an email to talk at ryanjesperson.com anytime. Check this out. I got this in the mail uh, just yesterday. Six new reasons to go check out the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. <laughs> the six new reasons to crave DQ. These are the signature. I couldn't wait to bring in this prop to show you these things, like the bacon two cheese deluxe, the original cheeseburger, the loaded steakhouse burger. I keep telling you about that one because it's got the uh, onion rings and the crispy bacon. Sure. Those DQ all beef patties that everybody loves. You can find them right now. The whole new lineup at the Dairy Queens in Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. And if you tell them through the drive through at the counter that you heard about them on Real Talk, they'll give you a nice big smile and a show of gratitude. I was going to say, would you get a free burger or something? But we do appreciate if you swing on by there and show them some love at the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. You know, another way to reach us, another way to get in touch with us, share your feedback is through our hashtag, RealTalkRJ. And if you watch regularly, you know by now it's powered by the team at Park Power. They're your friendly local utilities provider. Everybody, it seems, taking a look right now at what they're paying, especially for internet electricity and natural gas these are the payments that go out every single month maybe you don't think about them at least not until the price doubles jumps it's a great time to check out the fixed rate options at parkpower.ca could save you literally hundreds of dollars a month depending on your circumstance remember the promo code 2022 dash real talk gets you 70 bucks off your first bill from park power our friends at Infinity Healthcare, you know, I think of them often when we talk about things like COVID. We talk about going out in public. We talk about those that are especially vulnerable or in scenarios where the health might be precarious. Is this describing somebody in your life? Uh, maybe your parent, maybe a loved one, maybe your grandparents. They want to age in place. They want to stay in the security of their home, but you need to have the confidence they're getting, the home care that they need and that they deserve. You want to know that they're in good hands, that they're comfortable, that they're getting their medications, that they're actually eating their food. This is what Infinity Healthcare does with their team of committed caregivers. They have a personality matching service to make sure your caregiving situation is the perfect fit for you or your loved ones. You can check them out online at infinity 8 Ca, or you can just link to them under the Sponsors tab on our website. And our friends at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge want to remind you that they have in stock those 2022 Ram 1500 TRXs. Uh, my buddy Cam just picked one of these up. 
These Lucky. have like the big Hellcat motors in them, oh. like pushing 800 horsepower through the Ram 1500. And of course, the beautiful detailing, the styling that comes with the back to back to back Motor Trend Truck of the Year legacy. They've also got a great selection of not just new, but pre owned vehicles and, of course, a service team that they're proud of. You can explore their entire inventory, shop online, or book your service appointment by checking out St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge under the Sponsors tab on our website. Tomorrow's show is going to be a good one. We welcome back my good friend, the beloved and very intelligent, intuitive political commentator, Supriya Duvetti. Plus, we're really excited about National Medical Laboratory Week. When's the last time these medical professionals saw their time in the spotlight? It'll happen tomorrow. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Technical producer, John Hicks. Managing director, Josh Dunford. Account coordinator, Tanya Franklin. General manager, Katie Cook-Chivers. Website design, Mike Johnston. Voiceover by me, Carrie Skelton. Real Talk's editorial board is Supriya Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Anne Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto, and Nakota Sioux, home to Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is the flagship property of Relay Communications Group Incorporated. All rights reserved. For more, check out ryanjesperson.com.